everything changes darkness starts to tremble at the light that you bring and when you walk into the room every heart starts burning and nothing matters more than just to sit here at your feet and worship you Let's sing that verse again. When you walk into the room, everything changes. Darkness starts to tremble at the light that you bring. And when you walk into the room, every heart starts burning. And nothing matters more than just to sit here your feet and worship you. We worship you. Sing, we love you. We love you. We'll never stop.
You know, God showed me something right before we started. I um, thought this was pretty cool. So if you look at the sign on the stage that says reignite, if you take the five, if you take the five first letters of that, what does it say? Rain. I don't think that was a coincidence. It may have not have been planned, but I don't think it's a coincidence. Yeah. That's something to get excited about, ladies. Come on. And you know the crazy thing? When you reign and you unite, man, it gives the devil some high blood pressure. Let me tell you. Um, there's some powerful ladies in this body right now. Powerful ladies. But I have to ask this question. You know, the first line of this song says, when you walk into the room, everything changes. So I have to ask, what Jesus are we showing the world? It wasn't quite the reaction I expected, but <laughs> let, me, let me rephrase that. What Jesus should we be showing the world? Should we be showing them the Jesus that uh, is ugly to people and full of just bitterness and, and just everything gross? No. What Jesus do we show people? We show the Jesus that reigns. Amen? You know, I've, I've come across a lot of Christians that were just unhappy. Man, that's not cool. I don't want to see that Jesus. I don't think the world wants to see that Jesus either. You know, for too long the church has been in this position that we're supposed to point fingers at the, at the things that people do, and I don't think that's the image that the church is supposed to be at all. Um, you know, Jesus came to set us free from our sin. He came to, to free us so we could reign. And, it, and that doesn't mean reign over people in a way that's controlling or condemning, it's it's raining so that we can be free to love. You know, God has this way of taking all the broken pieces that are scattered everywhere and putting them all together. <laughs> I, man, it just, it, it completely confounds me how he can take something so broken, something that we see as completely useless and, and would throw out, and he can take it and make something completely beautiful. It's so amazing. I just, I want to encourage you guys that it's okay to be broken. All right, it's okay to not have it all together. We need to stop putting up this front as a church that we've got everything figured out. And I'm not just saying this church. I just mean the church as a whole. Because if we cannot allow ourselves to be broken, we cannot begin to even let God put us back together. Jesus was broken for us. You know, we get this picture of, of Christ hanging on the cross, and, you know, the only thing that's bloody is, like, his head and his wrists and his ankles. But the Bible says that his own mother didn't even recognize him. And he did that for us. He became the wretchedness that we, that we were. I'm not going to say that we are because... If you believe the word of God, then God says that he sees us through, through the blood of Christ and in that perfection. But Christ became so broken so God could put us back together. Guys, that's good news right there. That is such good news. So when you look at this sign throughout the rest of the day, I want you to look at those first five letters that says rain. And I want you to think about what that means to you. All right? God has given us power in the Holy Spirit. And when that power walks into a room, everything changes. Come on, guys. That's something to be excited about. So can we do that chorus again? Is that cool with you guys? Come on.
on, guys. I know you're awake. It's almost 11 o'clock. <laughs> I know some of you probably don't get up till 11. Uh, Nicole, where are you at? My daughter. <laughs> So let's, let's do this chorus again. And I want you guys to sing it like you mean it, all right? Like you are the reigning, powerful women that you are, okay? When you walk into the room, everything changes. The darkness starts to tremble at the light that you bring. And when you walk into the room, every heart starts burning, and nothing matters more than just to stand here at your feet and worship you. Come on, sing it out. We worship you. Sing, we love you. a shout of praise in the house. Come on. Hallelujah. Woo, my goodness. The energy just being in a room full of women. Tell you what, it's intimidating. I just have to tell you, I'm ill-equipped, unprepared. Uh, go ahead and take your seat if you want to. Uh, so good to be here. Wow, thank you, worship team. Let's give them another round of applause. Can we do that? <laughs> Hallelujah. Wow, you guys are just getting started. Goodness sakes, so excited for you and uh, excited to, to be here today. I have the privilege of introducing our first speaker this morning, quite a privilege. Uh, I've uh, known this woman of God, this woman of wonder, right, for probably about six years now. Uh, pretty interesting story. Her and her family, did you say six? Eight. Well, I ain't going to tell you where I got those stats from because I don't want to incriminate my other friend, uh, your husband, who told me that it was six. But uh, he's a guy. Like I said, we're ill-equipped. We're unprepared. We're, we're so far below where you girls are. It's just uh, we know it. We don't often say it, but I feel like I could say it right here. Okay, so, uh, right? Okay, so eight years? Has it been eight years? Oh, my goodness. Eight, eight years. Well, uh, so eight years ago, uh, Sabrina and her family moved back to this area and, and uh, reconnected and and uh, it was rough. It was uh, probably a year or two. She was just uh, two solid years. I didn't know if she was just running back to Georgia or what, because she was, uh, she was here. Uh, I, I believe in, in my heart, uh, and from speaking to her and her husband and family, uh, in uh, obedient love and reverence for her husband, who was moving back here for his family, and those things, and I, like I said, it was a couple of years before she really, you know, I don't know if we're supposed to be here, I don't know what this is, and how many know you, we have to give people grace sometimes, and just let them, you know, work through their own processes of, 
uh, you can tell people, you know, what you think God says, but they ultimately need to know what God says for themselves, right? And so she got that time, and uh, we saw, you know, that transition happen. And uh, not only was, was she, you know, just a blessing to her husband by just following his leadership, she got here, and when she knew that she knew that she knew that this was where she was supposed to be, she got under Pastor Marquita, and she got under me, and, and, and she became such a support and uh, such an encourager, and I have seen her grow and grow and grow. And this morning, as I was praying just about this simple introduction, God reminded me of Matthew chapter 8, where it talks about the faith of the centurion. And a centurion, a great leader, came to Jesus, and he said, hey, I need you to heal my servant, you know. And Jesus said, well, let's go. And he said, wait, 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 I'm not really worthy for you to come to my house and, you know, just at the spur of the moment, just speak the word only is, is, is what this leader said. And Jesus, the Bible says, marveled for a moment and says, my goodness, I have not seen so great a faith. And, and, and as the story goes on, we see that the centurion says, look, I, I understand authority because I am also a man under authority. See, we all want authority, but what we have to remember is the way to get it. You understand? And the centurion said, I understand authority because I am under authority. And because I am under authority, I can tell this one to go, and he goes, and this one to do this, and he does this. And Jesus said, oh my goodness, I haven't found any greater faith in all of Israel. And, and so Jesus spoke the word, and obviously his servant was healed. And uh, I have been blown away by Sabrina's willingness to come under authority and just be a blessing and hold up the arms of her pastor. Marquita and, and her senior pastor and her other staff. And I believe today what you're seeing is the fruit of that submission and, and God elevating her leadership. And I believe this is just the tip of the iceberg, sis. So I am very pleased to turn the pulpit over and the mic over to Sabrina Claus. And you guys give her a big round of applause. Let me put my stuff down so you can have a hug. Thank you. I love you, too. Go get them. I'm getting them. Go hold back. Wow. Good morning. Wow. I have, I have been um, beyond excited for this day for quite a while. I didn't sleep a, an ounce last night. So if I'm off a little bit today, that's why I'm, I'm sleep-deprived for a week. Um, but no, I am seriously so, 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 so blessed by every single woman that has walked in this place. I think we've nearly doubled our numbers from last year. So that's a witness in itself. That is a witness in itself. So that's just, it's amazing. Um, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, and thank you so much, Pastor. I don't know where he, he's probably already disappeared. I think we intimidated him a little bit. Um, but um, so yes, I, we did move back here in 2011 in the summer of 2011. So going um, in this, this July, I'll be going on eight year, eight full years back. But um, so I, my husband, he is the one that's doing our safety out there today. Um, so I have been married for 25 years, got married pretty young, um, literally 17 years old during my spring break senior year. We had to move it because um, just some different dates and stuff that were going on. So we moved it back from June to, to March. Um, so been married 25 years. I have two adult kids. My daughter is 21. She's back there at that table, as you can hear. And I have a son who is 18, just turned 18. You guys pray for me. Pray for me. An 18-year-old daughter is much easier than an 18-year-old son. I have, I have discovered this. Um, but anyways, but he's a pretty cool kid. He's a drag racer. He does drag racing a lot. Um, so there's constantly a vehicle in my driveway being torn apart and worked on to make it go faster. Which is, which is fun, because we usually have a lot of boys and a lot of diesel trucks at the house. It kind of reminds me of when he was little and he had all the collection of little trucks, and now they're just really big and they take my parking place. Um, and my daughter, she is a music major. She's doing music therapy, and she does a lot of different things. She has a heart for children and youth, and so she does a lot of stuff. Um, and then just, yeah, for me, I have been plugged in here since... Well, I'm, I'm going to say I've been plugged in here since probably 2000 and the end of 2013. <laughs> I was here in 2011. But um, 
But yeah, so I've been in women's ministry since 2004. I have been kind of in and out as we've moved and transitioned and things like that. And so God is just absolutely, uh, these last, since 2013, it's almost like you put, once you say yes to God and you step out in obedience, once you put your feet on the ground, there's no, there's no stopping when you truly know that's what God wants for you. And my dream, one of my biggest dreams, and I know you guys hear me say a lot, or like whenever I was advertising this and stuff, this is my dream. My dream is to bring, you know, the regions together, you know, not bring everybody, make them part of my church. I just want the regions, the women to come together and to learn and to grow in Christ and to change the world. And that's what we're here for. So, um, the three things that are really, really, really on my heart this morning, well, they have been for quite a while. Um, one is passion, one is glory, and the other is holiness. And last year, we, um, our, wow, our very first WOW, 2018, we actually called it WOW because it was just kind of the name Women of Wonder, because I actually was doing a Wonder Woman message off of the movie Wonder Woman. And it just kind of stuck, because that's who God created us to be. The Bible tells us that we are, we are children of wonder. And so that's what he created us to be. We are here to just, to just bring him to this world. And so that, that come back to my mind this last week, Romans 8, 19. I was really thinking through that. And, you know, Romans 8, 19 tells us that the, um, that the earth is literally like groaning and it's waiting in eager expectation for the revealing of the sons and the daughters of Christ. And that is something that is deep, deep within me because I am ready to see the manifest glory of God in this world. I am ready to see it. You see it in different places. There's little patches here and there where you see it, especially when you, when you watch overseas, when people go over on missions and things of that sort. You see a lot of the glory fall and healings happen and, you know, limbs grown out. I mean, just so many different things, chains broken. I'm ready to see that here in this region. And that is my goal. That is my mandate. That is the reason that God has placed me here. And so for many years, one of the things that I've noticed is that we've lost a passion and the, a lot of the church has just, it's, it's been a, a very, um, it's almost a disheartening thing to watch as the church has just become less and less passionate for the things of Christ. Um, we're kind of just about our own things. I have been just as guilty. I talked about this um, at our women's thing last month or in February, you know, just as guilty at getting so busy doing for God that we forget the passion of Christ. What, the he, what he's actually called us to do. And one of the things he showed me is that this passion that's going to take us from glory to glory is what the earth is waiting to be revealed. It's, it's what is all encompassed in that passion, and that's what I want to talk about today. So I really feel like God showed me that when we lose our passion, we lose our influence, and when we don't have influence, we don't have power, right? As Daughters of Christ, Miles Monroe says that as Daughters of Christ, we literally are created with influence power. Think about that. As a mom, you just got to look at your kid and you influence. Whatever you're doing, you just have to do that. I mean, that is how we are created is we are created for influence. And so when we lose our passion and we lose our purpose, we don't have influence. We just, we're just wandering around. And I want to kind of take you guys to a place today just talking about that. And then we're going to, there's going to, I mean, it's going to seem like I'm going from subject to subject, but it will all come together. I just want you guys to know that. Um, in Isaiah 59, I, you know, God's talking to Isaiah and he's saying, I can't find anybody out there to stand. I had, there's no man for me. And he said that, um, he said, the streets have fallen in justice. The, you know, he's like, the streets have fallen and there's, or justice has fallen in the streets. There's no man to stand up. And he said, so he, he was talking of God, put on his righteousness as a breastplate. And righteousness is, is uh, all encompassed in holiness. And then it says he put on the helmet of salvation. That word salvation there is Yeshua, which is victory and liberation. So he set, his, he set his mind on victory. And then he says that he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing, and, clothing, and then he was clad with zeal as, as a um, cloak. And that word zeal there is passion. He, he literally put passion on as a cloak and went about his business. One of the things that showed me was that God is passionate about justice. So why isn't the body of Christ? In John 2, 14 through 17, oh, good gracious sakes, where's my phone? Can, can you hand me my phone over there? I decided not to bring the Bible so I didn't have to put my glasses off and on all morning. But in John 2...
14 through 17, it says, And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. When he, had made a whip, when he went out, he made a whip of cords and he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and he poured out the changers' money and overturned all their tables. And he said to them, to those who sold the doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade or a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it had been written, and this was written, I believe, and it was in Isaiah. He said, zeal for your house has eaten me up. The passion for God's purpose, for God's will, the passion that, that for his father's business ate Jesus up. He was so passionate. And because of that, he performed so many signs and wonders and miracles. Why aren't we that passionate for the things of God? Why is that not stirring so deeply inside of us? Um, all, of the, all of the disciples, and when you study out all of them, it talks about how, you know, they were so passionate, they left their things. They literally left everything behind, you know? And then they, they went about and they did good and they did signs and wonders and miracles. And, you know, Peter walked on water and Paul went from being a heathen to, well, I think they all went from being heathens. But Paul went from being a Christian killer to a Christian maker. I mean, these people were so passionate. Why aren't we? And these are the questions that God began to ask me as I started to go through this. And so I began to ask him, God, why aren't we seeing signs and wonders and things of that sort in our region? Why aren't we seeing that? I love to go on and watch, you know, different um, churches and things of that sort whenever they're doing like live streams or whatever and they're praying over people and you're seeing people healed and you're seeing miracles happen and you're seeing that. And I'm like, I want that here. I want that passion. I want to be able to see people. My husband had a dream once, and this is something that we both have held onto so dearly, that the glory of God was so strong in the people in the house that people couldn't even make it to the doors and they were falling out. They were being healed. They were being set free. And he had that dream years before we ever moved here. But it's something that we both have like, in our gut, we're ready to see that. We're so ready to see that. And so one of the things God told me is he said, it's through my glory that this is possible. You know, we have to understand his glory. The glory of God is kavod. That is the, um, old, the Hebrew name for it is kavod. And that actually means the weighty presence. So you've got the presence of God living in you. When you get saved, when you receive Christ as your Savior and you believe in Jesus Christ, you have his presence in you. And then his glory is that manifested presence that comes upon you. Okay, that's what comes upon you. And that is when things begin to happen. Ryan Lestrange says it the best, and I absolutely love it. He says, when you enter into his glory, you leave the limitations of the earth. And that is something I have held on to, and I declare every single day. God, let me leave the limitations of this earth so I can see your glory in this, in this region, in this place, and in the atmosphere, everywhere I go to see that. Um, one of the best examples, I heard um, Bill Johnson give this example, and I thought it was the coolest thing ever. So he said he was trying to explain to, to his church wh how, how the glory of God works. And so the way he explained it, which was so neat, he said, in this whole room, there's a millionaire. You guys have no clue who it is, but there's a millionaire here. So you know his presence is here, right? Am I right? Okay. But when the millionaire gets up and starts handing out money, then his presence is manifested. Things are happening. The action is beginning. You're beginning to see what he's doing. He's actually bringing things about. That's the glory of God, the manifested presence of God, is when he makes himself known in that moment. And so he began to tell me that he desires to pour out more. I've heard the word more for quite a while um, I've seen different prophets prophesying it. I have heard it over and over and over. It, I think last year, one of my team members came to me, and, or maybe it was this year, I don't know, sometime, said, I just keep hearing more. I don't know more of what, but more. And um, he just told me, he said, I'm ready to pour out more of myself on the body of Christ, but my sons and daughters aren't ready. He said, so many of them aren't pure before me. And so I began to ask him, well, what do you mean by be pure before you? What do you mean by that? You know, we go to church. We do what we're supposed to do. We pray. We're, you know, we're reading our Bible. And he said that he's needing to call his church back into him, back into who he is, into his character, and into that place It is a place of holiness. And that is something that he has shown me over the last probably five months in myself as I've walked through this that we are lacking so much of in the body of Christ. Um, and I believe that this is what is waiting to be revealed 
this is what the world is waiting to see. They're ready to see a real people, not a fake people. They're ready to see signs and wonders and things of God coming in and just changing lives. I don't know how many people have come to me before and they were like, the thing that I love the most about you is that you like are so real. And then I kind of laugh and I'm like, kind of to a fault because I embarrass people sometimes because I tell things about my family. And, but it's like, why hide? Why hide? And, and that is something that I spent many, many, many years doing was hiding. You know, and I'll get into this in a little bit, but religion will tell you, wash the outside, but the inside doesn't really matter. Just make sure people think you're okay or, you know, that you look it. That's what religion will tell you, and that is not it. And so when he told me that he's calling us back to a place of holiness, the other thing he told me is he said, some will hear and some will not. But those who hear will heed the call and you'll begin to see the shift. And that rocked me to my core because I do not want to miss God for nothing for nothing. And so I have spent probably the last since December, I know for a fact, you know, daily on my face, God, show me, you know, I want to see this. I cannot afford to miss what you've got for me to do. I, we cannot, none of us can afford to miss what he's got for us to do. Do you guys realize that every single one of you, the minute that you're created and woven into your mother's womb, God says, this is your purpose. And he gives you a purpose. Every single one of you, there's not one of you here that does not have a purpose on this earth. And if we aren't seeking God and on our face and, you know, just drawing into him, we will never discover that purpose. We'll walk around aimlessly until the day that we die. And then we'll wonder why our life just, you know, we're supposed to be bringing heaven to earth, not living here, just doing whatever, and then going to heaven someday. And so we all have that purpose. So through that, my church has... um, Poor, the poor, they, all they hear from me is talk about Peter. And so we've actually started the study of Peter on Wednesday nights. So some of this, if you guys were here Wednesday night, just bear with me. You're gonna, it's, it's kind of a repeat. But um, Peter, between Peter and Paul, they are two of my favorite, um, two of my favorite disciples, I think. Because Paul had a passion that once he saw Christ was unstoppable. He took a passion, a relentless passion that he was taking. That, I mean, and this was religion doing this. He believed he was right going and killing Christians in the name of religion. And he was passionate about that. Did you know that when Timothy, it was T- Stephen, when Stephen was stoned, was it Stephen that was stoned? Um, when Stephen was stoned, Paul was a young man and he was standing over there holding the cloak while they stoned Stephen, one of the disciples. And you know, in his heart, he was thinking, man, this is what I'm... This is what I'm supposed to be doing. And he became passionate about that. And he did it, and he would go into places, and he would kill Christian after Christian after Christian. But the minute that he stopped on that road to Damascus, and his, you know, God met him on that road, the passion. I want you guys to think about that. The passion that he had for killing, like I said a minute ago, literally turned into a passion to save lives. And to me, that is so cool. And then you've got Peter. You know, Peter is the one that I'm drawn to because when you look at Peter, his story is amazing. He, you know, he was a fisherman, so we know he was pretty rough around the edges. The fishermen were pretty rough back in those days. And so, you know, when Jesus said, when he, I think his brother Andrew was the one that brought him to Jesus and um, introduced him. And Jesus said, oh, your name is is Simon Bar-Jonah, I think is how he, is the last part of it. And he said, but but I'm going to call you Peter. And that word Peter is rock. And I've heard it said, and I have, I have looked and looked and looked in the meanings of Simon, and I can't find it, but I heard somebody say once that Simon meant like a reed blowing in the wind. And I don't know where I heard that, but, but somebody was saying once that it's just like kind of something that just kind of blows to and fro. And God was telling, uh, Jesus was telling Peter, you're going to go from this to being a rock. And so... Whenever he began to, whenever he began to change, you know, he still was, oh my gosh, he was very daring, very brave. You know, when Jesus was walking on water, he's like, hey, can I come out there with you? You know, hey, and you know, Jesus is like, come on. And of course he sank, but give him credit. He tried and he took a few steps. I have not met any human yet that actually was able to make one step on water. So, I mean, he tried, you know, and then Jesus was able to take him down and, you know, pull him or take his hand and pull him back up, just like he does us whenever we get all anxious and excited and jump out and he's like, oh, come on, and he pulls us back up, you know. 
And that's just the way that Jesus is with us. And then, you know, and then turning around and, and God, <laughs> Jesus is walking with Peter and he's like, who do you say that I am? And Peter's like, well, so-and-so says this and so-and-so says this and so-and-so says that. And he goes, nope, I want to know who you say that I am. And Peter said, well, you are, you know, the, the, I don't even remember the right words at the moment, but you are the son of God. You know, you are Jesus Christ, the son of God. And so he turns around and he looks at him and he says, upon this rock, I will build my church. A few seconds later, he, according to scripture, he's talking to Peter and Peter starts rebuking Jesus. And so in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, so Jesus tells you upon this rock, I'm gonna build my church. So you're like, <clears throat> I'm the one. he didn't tell any of you 11, it's me. And then next thing you know, Jesus is like, you know, pretty soon, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be delivered over to the, you know, to the religious, the Pharisees. I'll be crucified, blah, blah, blah. And Peter's like, you know, you know, forbid, you know, no, that can't happen to you. And so Jesus turns around. And he's like, get behind me, Satan. You know, so how about going from being called the rock to Satan in the matter of one conversation? <laughs> and so, you know, when you look at Peter, he was probably prideful. You know, he was like trying to tell Jesus what to do. And he did the same thing whenever Jesus came to him and said he, needed to, he wanted to wash his feet. And he was like, oh, you aren't washing my feet. You know, I, pretty much I'm not good enough for you to wash my feet. I'm not worthy enough. You know, you're my, you're my Christ, you're my Savior, because Peter was the only one. And he told Peter, don't let anybody know this revelation yet. And so, but then Jesus says, well, if I can't wash your feet, then you have no part in me. And he's like, oh, oh, here you go. Wash my whole body. Wash my whole body. Take it all. You know, so, I mean, he was just, he was so... <laughs> He was so back and forth, you know, and so and that, and I love that because Jesus was always there to lift him back up when he messed up, you know, then he cuts the guard's ear off because he gets mad and Jesus is like, let me heal his ear and Peter, put your sword up, you know, calm down. And then, you know, I'm not going to deny you. And a couple hours later, I don't know who that is. You know, I mean, he was just like, whoa, 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 whoa. and so but the cool thing is, is whenever you really stop and you look, you know, Jesus, when he came back, when he was resurrected, you know, he met with Peter and he asked him, you know, do you love me? And Peter was like, yeah, you know, I love you. And he's like, then feed my sheep. And then he asks him again, do you love me? Oh, yes, I love you. Then go feed my sheep. And then the third time, Peter, do you love me? And he was like, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, then go feed my sheep. And I believe in my heart that that was him restoring the three denials that he had. He came back through and he restored that. And that did a shift in that man that from that point on, he was transforming the world. And so Jesus told him when he said, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And he said, and I will be giving you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And so that is one of the things that stuck out to me as I began to study Peter. The keys to the kingdom of heaven. How many of you guys here realize we, our mandate is to bring, it's hit your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So why is so much of the church not seeing his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven? We're missing some keys, some very vital keys. And so as I began to study Peter, I began to realize this man, if you go through the first and second books of Peter, which I highly, highly recommend you guys do, he was a man that, that um, oh, one of the things I wanted to get, the other thing that really um, attracts me to Peter is he was one of the ones that as he walked, once, once he was transformed and he took off with Christ with that same passion as Paul had, people would lay people out on the streets in their cots because they knew if just Peter's shadow would touch them, they would be healed. That's what you call walking under the shadow of God. That's what you call being under his glory. And that is what I began. I'm like, oh, I want that. I mean, is it wrong to want that? No, that's what God called us to. I was like, man, I want that. I want to walk into a room and see the atmosphere shift in a heartbeat. I want to be able to just walk along the street and people just be like falling out. I don't even have to touch them. And they, and they come back and they're made whole. They're made well. I'm a counselor, but you know what? If we were walking in that, I wouldn't need that. And I wouldn't need to be a counselor, which is fine with me. You know, I would rather walk by and see someone transformed in an instant than spend six months in a counseling office with them. That's my heart. And that's what I want to see happening again. And so one of the things I noticed, there was one main theme, one main theme that I found through the whole two letters of Peter. There's first and there's second Peter. And a lot, I mean, it was all wrapped around holiness, 
holiness. And I was like, well, God, I need to understand what this holiness is, you know, because I feel like I'm, well, I feel like I'm holy. I mean, I've been saved, I think, since I was four years old and, you know, followed Christ pretty much since, you know, but, but there's something missing because I'm not walking in what I desire to walk in. So what's missing? And 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16 says, he who called you is holy. You also be holy in all of your conduct because it is written, be holy for I am holy. I really struggled with, with this because one of the things about holiness is that in the name of religion, it has been twisted. And many churches, I think, have stopped teaching on it because of the twisting of it. I truly believe that. It's become such a difficult subject that it's like, we'll just stay away from it. And that, to me, is dangerous if we're going to be bringing the kingdom of heaven to this earth. That is how we lose our passion and our power. And so I struggled with this, with this message. Um, it was a very humbling message for me. These past, well, since December is when I started studying Peter. It has been, I have spent more time on my face than anything else, you know. Um, even during worship, I was telling Shane one week, I said, I can't even hardly stand anymore during worship because I just, just the humility, the, I mean, the humbling inside of how, of the awe of our God. And that's one of the things God showed me that we've lost is, is part of that. Um, the, the subject of holiness is very black and white. There's no gray. There's just not. You're either going or you're not. You know, the word of God tells us that it is better to be ice cold than to be lukewarm. So we're either walking in true holiness or we're not. But there's no fence line there. There's not. We're, and that's one of the things I think that I really struggled with. Um, Many of you guys here do not know me, uh, but the ones who do sit underneath of my teachings and my leadership, one of the things you, I do want you to know about me is there is nothing that I teach that I do not walk first. I won't. Um, I tried it before, and it really sucks because then you're held at a standard that you're like, oh, you know. So I have walked this. Um, I think Pastor said on Sunday, it's not practice what you preach, but it's preach what you practice. And that really touched me because that's my heart. And so that is something that, you know, if, if I'm teaching something, just know that I'm either in the middle of walking it or God's just brought me out of that. And this is something I will be walking out forever. So I will always be in it. If you see me doing things I shouldn't be doing, call me out. Okay, you have full, anyone has full permission for that. It does not bother me. But in the midst of jumping into this, it began to really turn me inside. I just began to have a lot of turning. God has revealed and he's removed so much, but yet he's replaced and he's restored even more. Um, my life has and continues to transform on a daily basis. I've had days, like I said, of silence and I couldn't, I mean, I would come in here to the office and go to my room and I would have to just shut my door because there was so much flowing through me that I had to just get it out, you know, get it out on paper or whatever. There's been those days and there's been days that they can't shut me up because it just, it just keeps coming out. Um, he's actually removed things, situations, and people. You know, there's times that when God's calling you to the next level, when he's calling you up higher, that he needs to remove people from your life and situations and things. And if we're not willing to let go of that stuff, then we're not going to change and we won't see the next and so, and that's hard. I mean, it really is. When you have people that you are, you know, just involved with and doing life with and stuff like that, and God begins to, to transform and move things, it's hard. But we have to be obedient. We have to be. And the cool thing about it is as he removes and, and takes situations and moves things around, he's always got something waiting on the other side. I saw a picture on Facebook the other day of, of a little girl holding a tiny teddy bear. Some of y'all may have seen it. And Jesus was standing in front of her holding his hand out, and she was like this, and he had this huge bear behind him. And he was like, you know, give this to me. And it was like, you never know what God has whenever you're willing to give up what he's going to turn around and restore with. And to me, that is the coolest thing ever because I have watched this cycle in my life. As God has grown me and matured me, it has been a constant, you know, it's like several months of one thing and then you flip and then you're like, okay, what's going to happen this time around? Um, and here a while back, I even was, I was even kind of angry and I said, well, who are you going to remove from my life now? I mean, because I, I feel like so many times we get so close to people and then he's like, you know, and so me and God have really real talks, and it's okay to do that. I just want y'all to know that, you know, so I, that's one of the things I asked him, well, who next? I mean, why do I make friends? 
You know, I mean, that was, and that was part of my struggle moving back here was um, we had, I was very plugged in at our church in Georgia and I had a, quite a few friends and, and um, I didn't understand why I was in ministry and I was in counseling and everything was going well. Why do you take, why would you take that away and put me here in 110 degree weather? That was like the first summer we were back, it was sandstorms. There was no rain. I remember looking out, we were renting a trailer back here before we bought our house. I remember looking out the window crying. I'm like, <laughs> I miss the green grass of Georgia. I could be at the beach right now. And it was just dirt blowing everywhere. And so it was, it was bad. It was a bad two years. Um, <laughs> I remember my mom walking in the house um, one Sunday, or no, it was probably a week, and I don't remember. Anyway, she's at the house, and she goes to leave, and she turns around, and she looks at me, and she goes, what happened to that little girl that was so passionate and so on fire and the counselor, the one that had such a drive and I was like, she's gone. I'm gonna stick with nursing. And I did, I told her, I said, she's gone. I don't wanna do that no more. I mean, I was so, not lost, but I was, I didn't understand why do you give me things and then take them away? I couldn't understand it, but my gosh, look today. I mean, he's gonna give, he's gonna take away and he's gonna give more. I mean, there is, no, I mean, it's just, it's humbling to me. It's massively humbling to me. So that was a side note for you guys to know. I'm not preaching something at you that I'm not willing to walk myself. But going back to religion, religion has taken the word holiness and they've made it about rules. This is something that I grew up, not in my home, but with family, distant family members. Um, a lot of them were, well, I think they still are a lot of my, my dad's side of the family. They're the Pentecostal holiness. And so I grew up with that, that mindset that holiness meant that I had to wear a dress and I couldn't swim in anything but a dress. And I ha couldn't cut my hair and I couldn't wear makeup and this girl needs makeup. Okay, there's no going without it. So I would just have to be a heathen the rest of my life. You know, that I couldn't do this and I couldn't do that, that you can't have a beer. You know, you can't have a glass of wine. That was the kind of stuff that I, when I thought of holiness, that's what I thought of, rules and regulations, right? So many times that's what we think of. We don't realize it's actually an internal heart stance. But the Pharisees were all about that. As long as their outsides appeared well, it didn't matter what their soul looked like inside. The Pharisees were the ones that, you know, they were always making laws and doctrine and taking contexts of scripture and, you know, taking it out of context. And they would take one scripture and build a whole religion off of it. And then they would take the 800 and something uh, uh, laws of whatever from the Old Testament and they like tried to live every single day by them. But yet all they were concerned about was their immaculate synagogues and the money that they could bring in. And don't you dare heal somebody on a Sunday. Don't you dare. You know, it was all rules. Don't get someone saved on a Sunday. That's work. You know, everything was rules and regulations. And Jesus told them in Matthew 23, he said that the Pharisees literally kept people from entering the kingdom of God. Their rules and regulations kept people from salvation. And then he says that they were literally as beautiful as whitewashed tombs. But then he turned around and he said, but you are full of dead man's bones, dissert, dissert, dissertation, self-indulgences and uncleanness. That's what religion does. One of the, I think pastor said it on Sunday. He was so in my message on Sunday. I was like, what are you doing? But you know, the, um, it's the, it's, the world doesn't have a problem with Jesus, right? Religion does. The Pharisees are who killed Jesus, not the world. So when we stop and we think about that, that pharisaical spirit that still wanders around in the church today, that's something that the, one of the first things we've got to squash. You know, we've got to squash religion in the church. But, you know, and also, you know, the Pharisees were, um, God, they were just, I don't even know. Like all through there, Jesus warns us, um, warned as all throughout um, his walk on this earth to be cautious of the leaven of the Pharisees. And I just think about yeast. You know, yeast gets into the bread and that's what causes it to rise, but it doesn't just do a single spot. It does all of it. So that, that leaven of the Pharisees, that religion. Um, the, and like I said, that spirit is still at work in the church today. And that is something that we have to, we, we, it has to be, it has to be vanished. If we're going to see the glory of God fall and we're going to see his manifested presence come in and start transforming lives out, not in this, I'm not in, okay, let me make a disclaimer here. When I'm talking about the church, I'm not talking about this building. I'm talking about each one of you. 
okay? So if we're going to see this stuff happen out on the streets where we're walking by and the glory of God hits somebody and heals them without us even touching them or speaking, religion has to go. Religion has to go. And so I do see, you know, I don't see anywhere in the Bible that the Pharisees went around doing any signs, wonders, or miracles. None. They looked good, but they didn't do anything. But I do see where Jesus constantly was going about rebuking them for what they did do. Because they did not love. And that love is the number one thing because God is love. And the Bible says that if we do not know love, then we do not know God. And so if we're not loving, and you also can't hate your brother and say you love God. Guys, it's all-encompassing. If we're carrying any form of hate, bitterness, or, dis- or um, unforgiveness in our hearts, it's, that's not love. And we're not connected properly. We're not in sync, and that's, got, that's another part that has to go. But that's February's message. Y'all go back and find that one. Okay, so... Um, but anyways, holiness, God didn't call us to look a certain way. One of the things that um, my husband and I had a conversation of, I was sharing this, I think, on one Wednesday night. But um, we were talking about tattoos. Like, I have several tattoos. And at his job, they had to, um, they, can't, they can't show their tattoos anymore. And he's a mechanic, which is weird to me, because I'm like, you, you ha- he has mechanics back there that have sleeves. And I'm like, in the summertime, oh, they're going to be hot, because they don't have an air-conditioned shop. So I kind of was, I was feeling a righteous anger for his, employ- his fellow employees, you know. I'm like, that's just wrong. And, and so anyways, we kind of started having this conversation. And, and I think he did it just to ruffle my feathers a little bit. But he goes, you know, for some people, it's probably about their holiness. And I looked at him and he was like, I didn't even know what to say. I said, do not tell me I can't walk in holiness because I have a tattoo. And he kind of grins and he walks off. And I was like, do not. And so, you know, we kind of went back and forth about it. But he, he, likes, to, he likes to give me a hard time sometimes. Um, but anyways, but that's something, that, um, it, that's something in me that's, that's a very, um, I don't want to say touchy subject, but, but it's something that really angers me. And the reason for that is because I remember I work, I'm, I'm also a nurse. I've been a nurse for 20 years. I left that back in, oh, it's been a year that I left my job. Um, but um, I had a man come in one day, and he had been off drugs, I think, for six or seven months, and sweetest, sweetest guy. And we sat in there, and we talked, and, you know, and I was checking him in and doing his history and stuff like that. And, and he was like, I'm just really struggling with depression. He said, really, really bad. And I said, okay. I said, well, is this some... Of, I'm not one to go straight to medication, so of course I'm like wanting to get into his business, and I really shouldn't have been, but I did. So I'm like, so is this something that's rooted in something else, or do you feel like this, is it like, literally, I mean, it can, we can have genetic, you know, it can be like chemical imbalances and things of that sort, but so I'm asking him, so is this something that's rooted, I mean, have you had problems? And so he starts telling me some of his life, and I said, God, I said, dude, you need a church. I said, you need men. I said, you need Christian men to surround you, and he goes, oh, I can't go to church. And I just kind of looked at him, and I was like, why can't you go to church? And he pulled up his arm, and he had tattoos. And he said, I walked into a church a few months ago, and I was met at the door and asked to never return. One town over. My heart stopped. I literally had to leave the room and go to the hallway and cry. I hurt for him. I'm like, you have, and Dr. Huser was like, you know, what's the matter with you? I'm like, you cannot tell me he can't. I mean, I was so, and he's like, you need to come back here. I mean, it was just, it hurt. I'm like, this is, this is a man that needs Christian men surrounding him and loving him, and he needs a church home. He needs somebody coming to him and saying, you don't have to be depressed. But because of the stinking whitewashed walls and not being able to love people, he's told, leave. What in the world? I was, that took me probably a week to get over. I leaned over and I looked at him after I calmed down and I went back in the room. I looked at him and I said, I'm a pastor in my church. I have three tattoos. I said, you're welcome at my church anytime. And I handed him one of my cards. And he was like, thank you. And I even called some of our men and I said, if you see this guy show up, I you know, couldn't give him the name, but I said, this is what he looks like. You know, If you see him show up, you better surround him. And it was a bunch of our life group guys at the time. Unfortunately, he did not show up, but I'm sure he had a lot of of stuff inside of him that he felt very judged. And, I, and I'm sure that would be a very scary move for him to walk into another church after being told that. So I even invited him to our life group. I'm like, you, can, you don't have to even come to church. You can come to my life group, you know. And, and so, but yeah, I'm like, this is not, not going to happen anymore on my watch. 
no more. I mean, I have, I have tattoos. My family's covered in tattoos. I have tons of friends that have. I mean, it's like, seriously, oh, I was mad. It made me want to go get like a whole entire sleeve and <laughs> go walk into that church and show it off. But I wouldn't because I'm not rebellious. I'm not rebellious. But I am determined. Is there a difference in that? <laughs> Anyways, okay, so back on my, on my notes here. Um, but anyways, going back to holiness, this is an internal posture, something that we have to allow change inside of ourselves. It is the character of Jesus Christ in us. It is all encompassing, it's him. And um, I believe it's time, one of the things I really feel in my heart is, is that it's time to rebuild that road to holiness in the body of Christ. It is time for us to start modeling that. The only way to rebuild something is to begin to model that and to begin to pray it in and begin to show it. Especially in today's day and age, people are watching constantly. They're constantly watching and they want to see how real you are. Um, when our internal posture lines up with God's heart, we will begin to see his glory flow. And so one of the things I began to really look at was how does this happen? I mean, literally, how do we get back to this place? How did we get off from this place? <laughs> that was one of the things that that I've been really asking God. When I think Shane, our guitar player that was up here, we were having this conversation probably about a month ago, and he asked me, he said, when did we, where did we get off? I mean, literally when, you know? And I said, I, I seriously believe it goes all the way back to the Pharisees. You know, it goes all the way back there to where they couldn't even accept the Jesus standing in front of them. And that religion just continued building its way into the church and building its way into the church. And so I wanna take the next few minutes and we're gonna do a little bit of a teaching moment. Um, so we're going to get into what holiness is. Holiness means consecrated. It means to be set apart, devoted, and assimilated unto God. And so we're going to stick with, we're going to go on to the consecrated. Holiness be, is being consecrated to God. Um, I love what Shane said a while ago about, you know, being able to, it's okay to be broken, it was part of my notes. I was just like, wow, that's really cool. Because one of the things that we see so much, or I see a lot in the, in the counseling office especially, is this disillusioned ideation that once we get saved, life has to be perfect. It has to be perfect. Much of it's been done, it's been actually done through religion, telling us that Christians, you know, they have to be quiet. Don't tell anybody that you've got problems. Don't tell anybody that you're broken this morning. You just put on that mask and you go in and you say, I am blessed and highly favored. But yet inside you're absolutely shattered. That is not what God wants. You know, and that is something that the body of Christ is here for each other. We have to start being here for each other and honestly being discerning enough that when they do stand there and say, I'm blessed and highly favored, pulling them aside and saying, no, you're not. What's going on? I taught a message to, our, to the ladies, I think it was two years ago or something. no. Yeah, it was two years ago. And I told him, I said, we should know each other so well that when we wake up in the morning, you know, with our stinky breath and our hair all crazy and our makeup smeared across our faces, you know, that, that there's nothing wrong with that, that we're just in each other's faces all the time. And when we see the ugliness, it's okay. We're going to love you past that. And we're going to love you through that. You know, there's no reason to judge it. Absolutely none. You know, we've got to start being honest with each other in the body of Christ and bring that back around. Um... And so we, one of the things that we really need to understand, you can take it what the word says. I think it was Paul that said to take all, to take, he takes joy in trials and tribulation. I think it was Paul that said that. What? Count it all joy. So, you know, when we're going through something, we can come in and say, I'm going through a trial, but it's going to turn out good instead of blessed and highly favored, you know? I mean, because count it all joy. Why? Because trials and tribulation and things of that sort are what builds us. That's what refines us. That's what actually gets us to a place of holiness and maturity. And so when we see someone going through something, yes, you're going through this, but my gosh, think of where you're going to be on the other side of it. You know, the two years of me sitting in my house doing nothing, but I was nursing, but, you know, just not, not doing any form of ministry. I wasn't even here half the time. I would I'll be honest with you guys. I was sitting at home watching my Georgia church online and Abe would come to church here. <laughs> But I was like, I just, I, I didn't know how to re put myself back into the, into the deal. I was so scared of, of giving myself away again and then everything being taken, you know? And so just going into that, you know, we need to just be able to know, to, to see that and see 
what am I, what am I going, why am I going through this? How can I get to the other side of it? And know that when we come out on that other side, that we are going to be more powerful and more successful and just more, you know, higher in the kingdom of God, just going and doing things that he's called us to do. So count the trials and tribulations as joy, knowing that it's through that testing of your faith that you're going to be brought higher. Um, and so consecrated is to, in the Greek, is to be made holy and pure internally. So it's the renewing of the soul. So you guys know that when we get saved, our spirit man's renewed, right? It becomes the spirit of Jesus Christ living inside of us. But we still have this crazy old soul that we have to deal with on a daily basis until the day that we die. And so our soul consists of our mind, our will, and our emotions. And so those are the things that as we consecrate ourselves to Christ, that we will be consecrating on a daily basis. Um, and you'll hear me say this a lot. Consecration is a process. It is a process we will be going through the rest of our lives because we are flesh and we're human. I think they're the same thing. And we will constantly be having things thrown at us that we have to overcome. It's just part of life. So we might as well just count it all joy. Um, when Jesus was praying in John 17, he asked God to consecrate those who follow him. He said, for their sake, I consecrated myself. And he says, so that they may be, may be consecrated in truth. And then he went on to say, I do not ask for these only, not just his disciples, but for all of those who will believe in me, all of those who will believe in me so that we are all one in him and we will have his glory in us and on us. And so Jesus Christ was consecrated. He consecrated himself unto his father as an example for us to do the same thing. You know, everything that Jesus did is our example, everything. Everything. He said when he went to be with the Father that great, the great works that he has done, but greater works will each and every one of us do because we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. So actually, we are supposed to portray him in greater ways. And so Jesus spent three and a half years doing miracle signs and wonders from a process of spending the first 30 years being raised and then being consecrated to Christ, to God. And then he was able for three and a half years to go and do all of the things that God called him to do. He was able to manifest his presence. And then he was able to die for each one of us so that now we can walk out that same process. Um, in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, it says, Now may, God, may the God of peace himself consecrate, sanctify you, same words, completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in Hebrews 13, 12, he says, we are, we are consecrated through Jesus Christ. John 17, 17 says, we are consecrated through the truth of his word. And John 1, 1 says that Jesus Christ was the word who came and dwelt among us. So we're consecrated in that, in his word. That is what we have to do. Get in that word, get into him. The more we study his life, his character, his actions, his words, the more we grow, the more we, we mature. The more we go through the more we have coming against us, the more we grow, the more we, we mature. 2 Corinthians 3, 16 and 8 to 18 talks about how when, before we are saved, we have a veil that covers us, okay? And that's why a lot of, you know, the Bible talks about how the world lives in darkness, okay? That darkness is actually a lack of knowledge. I have, that is something that, um, well, I taught that last year, um, but it's a lack of knowledge, and we are to be that bridge, that light of understanding to them. But they have a veil, and, so we, and that's one of the reasons why we can't judge the world for being the world. They don't know. You know, they've got that veil on. But the day that we become saved and we become Christ, that veil is literally moved. The spiritual veil is removed. And it says that because of that, we behold the glory of God as a mirror. So like we're, like we're mirroring his glory. We have that in us. And it is through that that we are transformed into his image going from glory to glory to glory. Is that not amazing to know that when that veil is removed and we have that chance to go from glory to glory to glory? It's our choice. Like I said earlier, we have the choice to, to keep going or to sit back and just do nothing, you know, but it's our choice. And so um, this internal transformation begins to reveal itself externally through our character, our actions, our words, our love for others. Glory pours out. We begin to manifest him through power, authority, signs, and wonders. This is being set apart and be in your heart and in your life, being consecrated and set apart. Holiness, number two, holiness is being set apart. 1 Peter 2, 9 tells us that we are a royal priesthood, a chosen generation, a people set apart, a holy people. 
We are a people set apart and a holy people. We are set apart so that we can proclaim his light, his knowledge, all that Jesus Christ is to the darkness of the world. That is why we're here. When we are truly set apart in our soul, the world can sense it. They literally are drawn to that. You know, they're drawn to the authenticity. They're drawn to the realness. They're just drawn to it. They can literally feel Jesus on us. Um, In Peter, it says that when Peter and them got done teaching, it says that they they marveled at their teaching because they were so bold and they were so, you know, just passionate about what they were doing because they marveled because they looked at them and said, we can see they're uneducated men, but my gosh, look what they're doing. We can tell that they have been with Jesus. That is something to grab a hold of. When you walk out of a room, people should look at the other people and say, oh my gosh, I can tell that person's been with Jesus. I can see it. I can feel it. That is what we should be doing when we walk into a room. Um, He's not saying that, um, well, he says, or to be set apart is to be set apart in our mind, will, and emotions, again, in our soul. And um, he is not saying here that to be set apart means that we can't be apart. You know, so many times we get the religious mindset that, okay, I'm set apart, so I can only be with Christian people, and I can only hang around with my Christian friends, and I can only do this, and I can only do that, and I have to follow this, and I have to follow that. No, he is saying, go be out in the world, but just don't act like them. Go be out there and transform lives, but don't become part of them. That's what he's saying. I think about Paul in 1 Corinthians 9, um, 19 through 23. He says, for though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more. And to the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might win Jews to those who are under the law as under the law that I might win those that are under the law. And to those who are without the law as without the law, not being without the law towards God, but under law towards Christ, that I might win those who are without the law. And to the weak, I became as weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. When he was out and about, he was doing what he needed to do, but yet he was also not judging them for who they were. And he was loving them without measure and in turn bringing salvation back to the body of Christ because he's just being him and he's just being the way that they are. you know. And like he said, doing it without also stepping out from underneath the law of Christ. And so he's an excellent example to look at. He knew how to be in Christ, but yet be out in the world. And that is something that that a lot of the body of Christ needs to learn. Um, This is the only way that we're going to draw the lost and bring in salvation. Um, I think that, well, okay, hang on. We're going to skip that part. Um, So what are we set apart in? What what did that first uh, first Peter 1.15 say? We are set apart in our conduct. It says in all conduct. Our conduct is our conversation. Our conduct is our behavior. And then the other meaning for conduct is our manner of life. So to me, that covers everything. We are to be holy and set apart in everything that we do. Um, Titus 1.8 says, Be hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled. Philippians tells us that to only let our conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Everywhere we go, I, uh, I was talking to my son this week. He was going through a little bit of a struggle. And um, I was, well, I, well, I'm going to say I was trying to talk to my son this week because he doesn't listen to me very well. And so he was telling me about a situation, so I was talking to him about it. And, and I, I do not know how to talk to somebody through something without Christ. I do not. And so I'm trying to talk to him, and he goes, oh. See, that's why I never ask you about anything, because you always have to preach at me. I said, I'm not preaching at you. I'm just telling you something, that this is the only way. I said, I'm a counselor. I've done this for a very long time. I know the steps that you need to take. No, if I wanted to preach, I'd go to church. He's like, that's all you ever do. You've got to put God in everything, you know? And it's like 18-year-old, you know? But I looked at him, and I said, Isaac, I said, I don't know how to talk about it any other way. You know, I don't. And I think it's because it's been so interwoven in me that I do not know how. And so the next day he was at school and I texted him. I'm like, I'm really sorry I'm, that you think I'm a bad mom, but I, I'm sorry. I will find somebody that you can talk to that won't preach at you. <laughs> but I was like, I don't know how to 
converse outside of that. But that's how we should all be. It should not be an abnormal thing, and we shouldn't have to apologize for it at all. Um, we had a friend in Georgia that, uh, he was a prophet friend of ours that traveled all over, and Abe loved it when he would come over to our house. He would always, Abe would always end up being his mechanic when he would drive through. And he was like, I love it because he doesn't talk about anything but God. He's like, you try to carry on a conversation about the car, and he's going to wrap it around to God. You carry on a conversation about this, he's going to wrap it around to this. You know, he was like, it's always about God. He's, and it, he's like, and he asked him one day, and he said, well, I don't know how to talk any other way. And I'm like, that's really cool. And, and I began to ask God to, to develop that in me. And I began to you know, see that developing. Um, so our conduct, everything that we do. Um, and for you young ladies out there, I want you to hear this. And let no man despise you for your youth, but still be an example to the believers in, the, in word, conduct, love, spirit, faith, purity, and holiness. So don't let people, when you're walking around school, talking about God and, and showing God. You don't even have to talk about him. Show his love. You don't have to mention him. Don't let him judge you for that. You know, keep going around and just showing his love and, and all of your conduct. Um, our conduct should be such a way that the world has no reason to speak against us. We're also told that in First Peter. The world should have no reason. When they do come at you with accusations, it should be found that you are walking in holiness, that there is nothing that they can hold against you and that you are honorable. When they're throwing things at you, you can come back and they can bring the judgment and you can say, you know, it's God. It's all honorable. Don't give them a reason to talk about, talk about you. Um, hope, number three, holiness is being devoted and assimilated to God. I love this one. I love it. Devoted is giving over to the display, the study, or the discussion of. That is to be sold out. Devoted is to be sold out to God. Matthew 6, tells us to seek first the kingdom of God and everything else that we need will be handed unto us. But to be sold out, to seek him first in every single thing we do. That is how our conduct begins to transform. That is how things begin to happen. And then in Colossians 3, 23, whatever you do, do it heartily as for the Lord and not for man. Everything we do should be done completely for God and not for man. And then the word assimilated, oh, I love this one, to become absorbed and integrated into a culture and a cause to resemble. Oh my gosh, think about that. Imagine being so lost in our Father, so undone before Him, so in sync with the rhythm of His heartbeat, and so close to His shadow that when we walk down the street, we're so absorbed into Him that when we walk down the street, lives are changed. When we walk into a room, the atmosphere shifts. Because with God, every, or with Jesus Christ in us, every demon has to bow at the knee. Every demon. So when you walk in a room, you should be carrying so much of him that every demon's like, whoa, 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 get back, get back. Here she comes. You know, what is that saying? The devil shudders when I, my feet hit the ground in the morning. Well, I want it to shudder the minute you open your eyes in the morning, not even have to hit the ground. But yes, being so, so um, integrated and absorbed into him that we begin to resemble him in everything. Um, this is a process of becoming more and more like God and going from that glory to glory to glory. In John 2, he says, By this we know that we are in him. Whoever says that they abide in, abide in him ought to walk the same way that Jesus walked. We should be carrying his character of holiness everywhere that we go. Jesus forgives others. He forgives, guys, even when they do the worst things. He tells his disciples, you need to forgive 70 times 7 per 24 hours. It's a lot of forgiveness. One of the things I heard taught here a while back was that means even every time the thought comes up that you haven't forgiven, you better forgive. doesn't mean the person comes back to you and does that same act, but when you think about what they did and you begin to get mad, you forgive. You walk in that. Jesus was unselfish. Oh, he gave everything up to his life for each one of us. He was humble and he was bold. He spoke no deceit. When they reviled against him, when they were spitting on him and they were throwing things at him and they were whipping him, he didn't return it. He just kept on going. When he suffered, he didn't threaten back. He was obedient to his father and he trusted himself to God. How many of us have a hard time trusting ourselves fully to God? We say, God, I trust you, but then we take it back. I think Amy and I kind of had that discussion about my message this week. It was funny because God had been telling me I needed, uh, it's a new level to learn to trust him more. We talked about it a little bit last night. But um, I am, 
for years, I've relied greatly on notes, lots and lots of notes. Pastor makes fun of me. Usually I'm about 13 pages in and 9,000 words by the time I'm done with the message. And, um, and so she messaged me the other day. And she goes, I've been praying for you. And all of a sudden, I got this, the word concise. I wasn't going to share it with you, but it won't leave, so I'm sending it to you. Well, when you look up concise, it pretty much means bring everything down to a a smaller, I don't know the exact meaning of it, but it was like, take something big and bring it down. Um, and I text her back and I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> I said, God's been telling me for like over a week to get rid of my notes. Like I had 13 pages of notes. And so I um, prayed about it through that day. I was a nervous wreck by that Wednesday night, did my teaching Wednesday night, got home and I was like, I told Abe, I said, I'm not happy with any of this stuff for Saturday. And he was like, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to rewrite it all. And he just looked at me. So I went from 13 down to five. That's a major thing for me. I think it was only 2,000 words. But, but it was being obedient to him. You know, uh, she told me, she texted me back and she said, that's your safety net. And I'm like, oh, you're right. I'm not going to deny that's my safety net. But God was asking me to trust him. You know, and we've got to come to that place where we trust ourselves to the hand of God. We have to come to that place. Um, Because of his character and his surrender, oh, another thing that he did not do is he did not tolerate religion, which we've got that clear. Um, Because of his character and his surrender to his father, Jesus also walked in power over over everything that the enemy threw at him. He walked in authority in this earth, taking control of the atmosphere, bringing a shift in God's glory into manifestation, and he walked in dominion over every demon that came across him. He even took dominion over death itself because of the glory inside of him, because of, who, because of his obedience to his father. And then, um, I don't know where the worship team's at. Do you guys want to come back up? Okay. Um, we're going to end with talking, you know, one of the best ways to allow God to come in and just begin to purify us and to, and to bring us to that place of holiness is to allow, you know, just his refining fire his refining fire just to come in and just burn away the dross, just to burn it all away. Um, He says in his word, be holy for I am holy. Our God is a consuming fire. And it is through that fire that we are able to be purified internally and see changes come into our character, our actions, our love, and our life to be just like Jesus. Um, Like I said a while ago, 1 Peter talks about how we are to, you know, we're going to face trials. And that's one of the reasons that he wrote the letter to, um, to the churches. First and second Peter were written to um, a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of churches that were dispersed all throughout the um, Asia Minor because that was during the reign of Nero. And Nero was one of the most sadistic and most cruel leaders they had. Um, he would take Christians and he would put them in the middle of his big, huge Colosseum rings and he would have them his games to their death. He would take Christians and he would drive, uh, drive stakes through them. He would, um, he would just do, oh, he was, he was horrible, horrible, horrible. And so Paul or Peter was writing to these churches because he was trying to tell them, listen, I understand the persecution that you're going through. And these churches had been, um, they were scattered all over the place because they were hiding from Nero, okay? And so he being the one that Christ built the church upon, he was sending out encouragement. I understand the persecution that you're facing. I understand that because of what's happening, we are of the lowest status. We are the ones that don't have much. The government did not support them at all because if the government found them, they were gonna take care of them because Nero had ordered all Christians dead. And so he was encouraging them, you know, keep going, keep going, keep going. There is purpose in this. There is purpose in it, you know? And so he just kept on and kept on pushing them. And he said, you know, it's through these trials, through these tests, and it is through all of that that we are literally so refined by the consuming fire of God. You know, the Word of God tells us that God, that He is a consuming fire. And it is through that that He comes in there and He takes care of the stuff. He takes care of all of that stuff. And um, He told me that it's time... Um, God told me the other day when I was praying, he said that he is fixing to send his, see literally lifelong structures that have kept you bound. Did you know in 1 Peter, he said, in 1 Peter 1, he says that we are redeemed from the aimless traditions of our fathers. And when you study out that aimless tradition, did you know aimless literally goes back to the, been put upon us through our fathers, 
you know, our father's fathers through the generations, generation. And he said he's going to come in and he's going to bring out the surrender to him. He said he's sending his fire to refine the church. And that's us, guys, in preparation for his glory to fall in a move that many have not seen yet. This had me so excited. I was like, okay, let's let it happen today. Let it be today that we begin to see these structures fall and the refiner's fire come in and burn starts with each one of you here today. The refining fire is calling us into a depth with him that we do not know of. We do not understand the depths of love. And I was in a very, like, I don't cry, but that year I had spent a lot of, I think I'd just gone to Haiti and I'd spent a lot of time just, he was softening me, you know, he's really softening me. And I didn't know, um, Christy, she's over here at table two. I didn't know her at the time, but I walked into Lauren um, Binder's office and she was her receptionist. And I'm sitting there waiting on Lauren to come in there and she goes, I've got to tell you something. And I said, okay, you can tell me. And so she starts telling me, she said, God just said, he's fixing to take you deeper. He's taking you deeper into love. He's taking you. And I'm like, sitting there and I've got tears running down my face because all I can think of is how much deeper is it going to go? I'm already a mushy mess, but that's where he wants to take us. He wants to take each one of us here today to a deeper, deeper, deeper level in him so that we can walk in that holiness, so that we can come forth and we can be the women of God that he calls us to be. We can be the women of wonder. And when we leave a room, we leave people wondering in a good way not in a bad way. Please don't leave people wondering in a bad way. So I want to take this time. Isaiah 61 says to arise and shine for your light has come. The knowledge and understanding has come. You guys have it. Can't deny it now. You've been sitting here for the last hour. So it's in you and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. The darkness and the lack of understanding will cover the earth and a deep ignorance the people, but the Lord will arise over each one of you and his glory will come and transform this world. The lost will literally come to your light. They're gonna see Jesus in you and his word right here says, the lost will be drawn to you. You're gonna be walking down the street and people are gonna be like this. They're gonna be going, <laughs> you know, what is, they're gonna to wanna to rub on you. They're gonna to wanna to know what's different about you. And that's what the refiner's fire is gonna do. It's gonna bring you guys to a different level. And so if, I just wanna invite you guys up. We're gonna take the next probably 20 minutes or so if you want to come up and pray to Mark Weed if you want to come up and let God just refine you today he wants to literally just pour himself completely into you and just bring out all of the things you guys have been carrying guys we carry hurt we carry brokenness we carry things that it's okay please know it's okay there's no nobody here that's going to judge that today but we want to see you leave without it so come on up here let's let the refiner's fire completely rock your world today
So I yield to into your careful 
There's new wine, cause there is new wine, there is new power, there is new freedom, the kingdom is here, I lay down my old flames to carry your new fire today.
So, so good. So good. Amazing worship. Um, oh, we could have just done that all day long, like for real. I mean, I don't know that their voices would have wanted to do that all day long. But anyways, yes, Pam is going to come up here and she's going to transition you guys. She's got a few housekeeping details and then it'll be time for some lunch. You guys ready for some lunch? All right. Yay for food, huh? I like food. Food is good. Well... Isn't the Holy Spirit wonderful? He deserves a, 
of applause. You know, I wanted to mention just a minute. Um, I have a new line of jewelry. It's a series, and it's beautiful restoration. And this came about, somebody gave me cases of old glazes. They're dried up. They're unusable. And the Lord told me, you know, on this piece are all these colors. Each color represents a story, something that's happened in our lives, good, bad, ugly. But with those glazes, if we turn them over to the Father, that's the key point. We have to turn them over to our Creator. If we don't, He can't do anything about it. He can't take what we don't give Him. And if we give it to Him, my kiln goes to 2200 degrees. And at 2200 degrees, those glazes melt and change and their colors become vibrant. When we allow the Holy Spirit to take all that junk, then we can fulfill where we're supposed to be. So I just wanted to share that with you. They're out there. Um, okay, so we're going to start with table number one so you guys can go eat. And then we'll just uh, fill in, go table by table. Uh, instead of waiting in line, if you would like to use selfie station and take pictures, welcome yourself to do that. And um, I just want to thank each and every one of you for being here. And I want to give a big shout out to all of our hostesses. All the hostesses from your table, would you stand up for a minute? They have worked so hard, and they have been little busy bees trying to make their table so special. And I just think they did an awesome job, and uh, each one is so different, and that's what makes it fun. They're so different, just like we are. So we'll start with number one. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we just thank you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for all the hard work that's gone into this, and dear Lord, Thanks for showing up. There are ladies that are here that are not going to walk out those doors the same. And we thank you for that. Bless this food to our bodies and all that has prepared it. In Jesus' name we pray. Oh, one more thing. The backdrop back here. I had help. Lena and uh, Hannah helped me paint it. And I think they did a great job. So thank you very much. Hannah said I wasn't loud enough, so make sure you take your plates to eat off of, okay? Okay. 